you. What an honor it is to be with you tonight. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And in just a moment, we're going to look at a section of Scripture there. If you don't have your Bibles, don't worry about it one mic. You can actually memorize our text tonight. We're just going to simply look at one verse tonight. And literally, you can memorize it. It is going to be that simple. And it will be life transforming if you can take this and then apply this to your actual life. Don't forget, you can text marriage to 56316. And I won't get that here. Jenny will get that out there. And uh, you can look at what's going on in that moment. So Romans 12 and verse number 18 is what we're going to look at tonight. So Pastor Kurt talked about contentment this morning. And so much of our contentment rests on the idea of our relationships being in a settled kind of state. And what Paul does in Romans chapter 12 and specifically verse number 18 is he gives us a pathway by which you and I can more likely have our relationships in that kind of settled state. So, so whenever we look at Romans chapter 12 verse number 18, we take this, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, And so we can take this passage, we can break it down into four basic concepts uh, of what's going on. And here's how we're going to look at it tonight. And you have these clauses that are here. And this concept of, 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 of these four segments of, of what's going on here. And so whenever you look at verse, uh, chapter number 12 and, and verse number 18, Paul, in the book of Romans, is writing to the church at Rome that is filled with both Jews and, and Gentiles. And there's a great divide. So there's this great deal of tension that is going on. We cannot understand the cultural and social divide of what is going on there. Literally, the, the divide that we have between Democrats and Republicans does not compare in the strife of what was going on between the Jews and the Gentiles. What Paul is saying as he looks at this great cultural division that society has no ability to solve, that the gospel has that ability to bridge, bring together these two groups of people and to merge them now into God's holy people. So he writes the book uh, of Romans to the church at Rome to introduce the gospel in many ways. And chapter one, verses 16 to 17 is kind of the key verse. And he talks about how he is not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation, first for the Jews and then to the Greeks. And then through chapter one through eight, we have this great theology, probably the greatest theological treaties that we have in all the New Testament. Chapters 9 through 11, you have this parentheses of what is God going to do with Israel? I know nobody would ask that question today, but back then it was such a great question. And so Paul answers it in chapters 9 through 11. And then the rest of the book, chapters 12 through 16, he, he then answers the question, so what? Based on the theology of chapters 1 through 8, now how are you and I supposed to respond to it? And so in chapter 12, verse number 1, we have that great verse uh, of, of that idea that, that I urge you, brothers and sisters, to, in view of God's mercy, to, to live a life now that, that responds to that in a powerful way to offer our, our bodies as living sacrifices. And then he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you'll be able to figure out what is the right thing to do. And, and then he talks a little bit about humility and then through the rest of chapter 12, he gives us this idea of what does love do? What, what does love in action look like? The NIV translates it in that way. I think the ESV says these are the marks of a true Christian, that if God has truly touched your life, here's what you're going to do. And in the midst of talking about loving enemies, in this church between Jews and Gentiles, loving enemies, we have this verse, verse number 18 of chapter number 12. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. So we can see the command immediately here is this idea of live at peace. That is, that is the command of what we're actually supposed to do. So if you are a follower of Jesus, this is now the task that is before you. Whenever we think about peace, we think about this idea that, that it begins with God, it goes to, other, to self, and then ultimately it ends up with others. So, so peace begins first and foremost with God. We see that in, in chapter 5, that Jesus has now made a way for you and I to be at peace with God. And, and once we have our eternity settled, once sin is taken off of our backs, we now have this ability to have this stability, even in the midst of all the chaos that is around us. And, and as God makes us right with himself, it begins to change who we are. And as we begin to get peace inside of us, don't forget it's the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. As that peace begins to reside within us, it begins to flow out of us 
and begins to impact other relationships to such an extent that Jesus is going to say his followers will be known as peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of earth. And so this process of peace now happens first and foremost with God, then inside of us, and then it pours out to others. And so here's what that means. If we're having struggle with relationships with other people, we can begin to ask the question, are we really at peace inside of ourselves? And if we're not at peace inside of ourselves, are we really at peace with God? And so if you want contentment, if you want a settled relationship with other people, it starts first and foremost with your relationship with God. I have a question for you tonight. Are you at peace with God? Confident of it. Not because of anything that you have done. Not because of your own achievements. But because of the the spilt blood of Jesus Christ. Because uh, of the sacrifice that God has made on our behalf. Do you stake your entire life and claim now on not the work that you have done, but the work that Jesus has now done for you? Has the weight of your sin been taken off of you? And you know one day you can stand before a just and holy God, completely blameless, not because of what you have done, but because of what God has done for you. Do you have that? Do you know it? If the answer is no, you have no chance at peace until you get that right. But if the answer is yes, why don't you have peace? Shouldn't that transform everything? And there's no question that peace is a process. I don't don't doubt that. But once we get that stability of peace with God, it should begin to impact every aspect of who we are, especially how we relate to others. Now, Now, notice this other order. It goes self and then others, not others than self. Here's something we often don't know. Our relationship with others is most often a symptom of our relationship with ourselves. So so if you have one tense relationship, you can just mark that off as, hey, that's just that relationship. There's something going on. But if you have a series of difficulties whenever it comes to relationship with others, listen, that has nothing to do with them and everything to do with you. And we project upon others what is actually going on inside of our own hearts. So, so there, there's a guy back in Arkansas. So I, I was a pastor there, right, for, for 19 years, moved here a couple years ago. And, and there's a guy back in Arkansas who, whenever he is drunk on a Friday night, will, uh, which is regularly, um, will text me about how happy he is that I'm no longer in Arkansas and how horrible of a pastor I was, even though I was never his pastor. And then he'll take pictures of people that dislike me and all those kinds of things. And he just, he just will lambast me on a continual basis. If you don't know what it means to be lambasted, you're not from Arkansas. And so Jenny one day asked me, how, do, how can you deal with this? And I told her, I said, Jenny, think about this. The voice he speaks to me when he's drunk on a Friday night is the voice that speaks to himself every single day of his life. Whoever's most critical in your life, that's the voice they're hearing inside their head on a daily basis. And their their criticism to you actually has nothing to do with you. They're they're just reaching out to have somebody else experience the pain that they're going through. As you look at relationships, again, one relationship, one-off relationship, we can push that aside. But as you look at the overall picture of all your relationships... It is an indicator of your own individual health. And if you want to change your relationships, change yourself. It's why the greatest piece of marriage advice I can give you in this moment is work on yourself. Stop trying to change your spouse and get to work on who you actually are. And in so doing, that will begin to change others. And so if we're called to live at peace with others, it goes in this order of God and self and others. But what does peace actually mean? Peace can mean a lot of different things. I, I think of it in the very simplest terms. Peace means you're not against me. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're for me, but I hope you are. But it at least means that we're living in some kind of settled state where we can coexist and I don't feel like you're a threat, and you don't feel like I'm a threat, and I'm not standing in your way, and you're not standing in my way. And what Paul is calling the church to do here now is to coexist in this culture, in this pagan and lost culture. Christians should have the ability to now, as best as they can, coexist with everybody else. It's a great call in California to recognize that, that we should have the ability. If anybody can live in California, it should be Christians. We should have this ability because of what God has done for us to coexist. So this is now his command to us. 
that to the best of our ability now, we are to live at peace. Uh, notice, live at peace with everyone. But, but here's the interesting thing. While everyone, in, in some regard, is just everybody, there are different types of, of, of everyones. So, Henry Cloud, whenever I first got here, uh, we, we did an online summit, and Henry Cloud spoke, and he spoke out of the book of Proverbs. And he talks about in Proverbs, there are three different types uh, of people. And, and he says there are wise people, there are foolish people, and there are evil people. And there are bad handwriting. There are those four types of people. So, so he talks about there are wise people, foolish people, and evil people. So whenever you look at every one, Every one includes these three different types of people. And, and what Henry Cloud says is if you look at the book of Proverbs, the, the, the writer of the book of Proverbs tells us to respond to these people in different ways. So with wise people, it doesn't mean they're perfect, it doesn't mean they get everything right, but wise people, you can talk to them and that communication changes things. So wise people, you can have a conversation. You can be confronted with a sin. You, you can see how your actions are impacting somebody else. Wise people are changed by communication. Foolish people aren't that way. You can talk to a foolish person all you want, and they're not going to change whatsoever. And what Cloud says is whenever it comes to foolish people, uh, you need some kind of, uh, of now consequences, some kind of limits uh, that are actually there. So, so they begin to recognize that their choices have consequences. And, and notice this, from a parenting perspective, uh, whenever your kids are born, they don't have the maturity to be wise. Hopefully they're not evil, uh, but they are foolish. They're foolish. You, you can't sit down to a four-year-old and say, hey, here's why you can't throw that temper tantrum in the midst of Safeway. It's not going to work. You have to give them consequences until they begin to understand how their actions are impacting their own lives. And hopefully you finally get to a point. I feel like we're to the point now with our kids, right? So, so our youngest is now 15. And literally, there's times in which I give him consequences. But more often than not, he is to a point now where he lives somewhat in, in wisdom where I can have a conversation with him and that can change action. But if the conversation doesn't change action, you could be dealing with a foolish person and they now need consequences. And then there are some people who are evil. And what Cloud says is with evil people, that's where you need restraint. That's where they need to be locked up. They need to be distanced in some way. So as we're looking at living at peace with everyone, we need to recognize that while the general pursuit is always the same, it's peace, that that, that will look three different ways depending on what's going on. And that if we're seeking to live at peace with a wise person, no matter how great the disagreement is, literally conversation can lead to peace. But if you're dealing with a foolish person, conversation won't do any good. You're going to have to find a way to now have consequences and limits to what's going on in their lives. And, and if, if they're an evil person, our goal is still to live at peace with them. But you're probably going to have to have some kind of restraint, and peace might be an extreme amount of distance. Notice what this means in part. Think about this from a holiday perspective. Let's say you had the horrific experience of being abused as a child. If you read this without any consideration, you can think, oh my goodness, God is calling me to be at peace with my abuser, and, and that means I have to go to Thanksgiving dinner with him. It's not the case at all. You can be at peace with that person. You can, you can no longer be against them, but it doesn't mean you have to be in the same room with them. You can, you can be at peace with them while at the same time testifying so that they are now imprisoned because of who they actually are. The, the process, the desire here is the same, and it looks in different ways. So, so be at peace with everyone, but notice if it's possible. Which, which what that means here is... Sometimes it's not. There are times in which it is not possible to live at peace with other people. And what are those times? What are those situations? Well, if, if they cannot in any way accept you as a follower of Jesus, you may not be able to live in peace with them. Hamas cannot wisely be talked to and go, oh, you're a Christian, okay, we'll respect that. Hamas is evil. And so because of that, now it's not going to be possible to live at peace 
with them because they, want, they literally want our destruction. So there are some who will not, cannot in any way accept what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And because we are commanded to follow the ways of Jesus, we can't live at peace with them. And, and then there are others that we can't be at peace with simply because they're not accepting peace. And, and in, in many situations, what's going on is inside of themselves, they are so disordered they do not have the capacity to live in an ordered way with you. I remember whenever I first got here, I was sitting down with one of our counselors, and I said, hey, I always had this theory that about 10% of the population just can't get married. And I don't mean can't get married as in they can't find anybody. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they, they can't get married in that they shouldn't get married because it won't work. Like they do not have the personality type. Maybe they have trauma. Maybe what's going They do not have the ability to, to be married to somebody else. And this counselor said, oh, no, Kevin, you're dead wrong. It is much higher than that. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, sometimes what marriage demands of us, some people, because of their own experience and where they currently are in life, do not have the ability to look past their own trauma and to love somebody else. And so there could be people in your life that, that because of their own hurt, because of their own sorrow, because of their own trauma, because of their own inability to do the work, that they're so disordered in their selves and so maybe sometimes distanced from God, although they could, they could be a believer, but they just, that, that, that hasn't penetrated yet. They haven't had the sanctifying process at this moment or, or their pain is so much that they're just not to a point yet where they can actually be at peace with you. It's one of the strangest things as a pastor is sometimes people project upon us their actual feelings toward either God the Father or their own actual Father. And it's one of those strangest things. It took me about 10 years to recognize this. There'd be times in which I'd have people just unbelievably angry at me for reasons I could not understand. Now, there were other times people would be unbelievably angry at me for reasons I did understand. I'm like, yeah, I'd be mad too. But there were these other times it just didn't fit the context. And, and what I learned later is they were projecting upon me what was going on inside of themselves. Do not let the hurt of other people define your heart. Some people aren't going to like you. And that actually has very little to do with you. There are some in this room of you experienced a heartbreak of, of divorce. And it's hard to even imagine this, but it's true. Your spouse's failure to love you actually has nothing to do with you. It was their own inability to find peace within themselves that they never, you never had a chance to experience it for you. And it, it might be possible what you need to do in this moment is to let go, as we were just singing, of your own judgment of yourself. And so sometimes it's not possible. But, but most of the time it is. Most of the time there is a way to live at peace with everyone. But yet notice where our focus needs to be. As far as it depends on you. This is what belongs to me. I, I, am I living in such a way that, that now I'm doing everything in my power uh, to present somebody else the opportunity to have peace with me, to live in a settled state, to where I'm not fighting against them, I'm not trying to hold them back, I'm not trying to use them or manipulate them, but instead I'm actually for them, I'm actually pushing them forward, I'm actually cheering them on, I, I, I'm actually in this moment to their benefit, now my existence now is for their good. Uh, as far as it depends on you, you control that. Now, I want you to think just for a moment as you look at your own relationships. Is there any relationship out there that you can look at and you can look at your own hands and you can say, you know what? My hands aren't clean here. That, that I, I have failed and I haven't sought forgiveness. Or I, I've held a grudge. Or, or I wasn't fair. Or I'm judging them in some way, or I'm projecting upon them, or I'm, I, I, I'm trying to work out my own trauma on their lives, and it's not really their fault. Have you done everything in your power to create a climate in which you have a chance for relationship? Now notice, 
Now, notice, I can extend my hand all I want, but that doesn't guarantee I'm going to have a relationship with you. There's still a work that you have to do. Uh, but notice what Paul is saying here is don't focus on that. Uh, don't fixate on the idea of the relationship actually being reconciled. Uh, fixate on what you actually control and making sure you have done your part to communicate uh, your own failures, to own everything that you need to own and absolutely nothing else, and then to do the best ability that you have to create a climate in which you can actually live at peace. What would that look like? What would that look like at Christmas? What, what would that look like in the context of your family? Notice this. Romans is written to this great societal divide. It's about loving your enemies. I don't know if there's anywhere this applies more than with your own family. Why is family so hard? You know why it's hard? Because God created us in families, and he created us in part to learn who we are, who he, he is, and who others are through families, and we are fallen, sin-filled people. And so all of us have been raised by sinners, and rejection's hard, and it attacks the very core of who we are, and, and, and it is such an impactful aspect on our own lives that we don't respond very well. So have you ever find yourself saying things that you don't really mean? Acting in ways with your spouse or with your mom or your dad or your son or daughter. Acting in ways that you would never act with me. It's because deep within us is this desperate need to be loved. To be known and seen and valued. But notice whenever we get that from God. And we begin to feel that within ourselves. We could be able to pass that on to others. And one of the greatest classrooms that we have for learning contentment are our own families. And the greatest schoolroom that we might have could be Thanksgiving morning with that uncle. You know that uncle. Just tough to love. If you don't know that uncle, you are that uncle who says the wrong things, who just has a way about him. And is it possible that God has placed you in that moment in part to make sure that you're getting your identity from God, not from him? To giving you an opportunity in the midst of a little bit of chaos, no, 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 to live a life of peace. Is it possible that God has planted you in some circumstances in your life that are difficult so that you can learn to lean on him a little bit more, transform on the inside a little bit, and then immediately have some application points where you can figure out what does it mean to love this person. If it is possible, sometimes it's not. As far as it depends on you, that's all you can control. Live at peace. Doesn't mean a reconciled relationship necessarily. Live in a settled state to the best of your ability. With everyone knowing it's going to look different depending on who that everyone is. we got about 10 minutes. Let's do some questions. Jenny is out there in the crowd. Doesn't like to be on stage. She likes to be there. And so, Jenny, what, what do we have? The one out-of-town relative that overstays their welcome. They give you their arrival date but no departure date. Yeah, yeah. How do you ask them to leave without hurting their feelings? Okay, so... I get this, totally. This, this is, I think this is solvable. Here's what you do. When the next holiday is coming up, don't give a blanket invitation. Here, here's the thing. Clarity, especially in relationships, is kindness. And, and so send them a text message. Call them whatever. Say, if it's Christmas, say, oh, my goodness, we're planning for Christmas. We are so looking forward to you getting here. Uh, we, we hope that you can come in on one of these days. When are you coming in? They tell you the date. Great. Hey, we have some other plans, and so we're going to need you to, to leave by around this date. Which, which date around here would you like to leave? We'd love to have you stay that whole time if you can. If you have to go early, we understand. But here's the thing. What happens in a family is we feel like clarity is unkind. But no, a lack of clarity leads to bitterness. Clarity is kindness. Now, now notice this whenever it comes to communication. There, there, there's three different types of communication. You have aggressive, you have passive, and then you have assertive. 
Assertive communication is loving and kind. You are saying, here's what I want, here's what I need, here's what I desire. I'm not being dogmatic about it, but, but here's my way of thinking. Aggressive is I'm yelling, I'm screaming, I'm being dogmatic. This is the way it has to be. I don't want a real conversation. Fools use aggressive language or fools use passive language, which is I'm not really going to tell you. I hope you're going to read between the lines. I hope you're going to figure it out. And if you don't, I'm going to be mad at you, but I'm never going to let you know that I'm mad at you. And you can also be passive aggressive, by the way. Learn to be assertive. Here's the thing about that question right there. The question right there thinks the problem is with the guests. No, the problem is with you. You have not clearly communicated what it is that you desire. You're hoping they just understand and you're bitter that they haven't. They have no chance. You have to communicate. Here's the window by which we would be more than welcome for you to stay the whole time or part of the time. Where in that window would you like to be? But after that, we have other plans. Sorry. If you do that, they may may struggle at first. But if you do that consistently, they will begin to appreciate it, and they will begin to understand you're actually loving them well. Be assertive. Don't be aggressive, but don't be passive. You're currently being passive. Now everybody's going to be terrified to ask a question because of how aggressively I went with that. Go ahead. How can you create a climate of peace in a situation with no chance of reconciliation, like when the perpetrator has passed away with no chance of closure? Oh, that, okay. Yeah, well, that, that went a different direction than what I was expecting there. So... So when there's, when there's no chance, that now peace ultimately com- becomes between you and God. It, it's, no longer, uh, uh, it's no longer about them. You, you have to now trust to them what, what actually belongs to them. Think, think about this idea of uh, e- even in the concept of stay in your lane. Y'all have seen this. Y'all are tired of this. You have what's mine, what's theirs, what's God's. That's what's theirs, trust me. Okay. So, so then beyond that, you have the CIA. So you want to control what's mine, influence what's theirs, accept what's God's. In this situation where your abuser or this other person has now passed away, or maybe the person you failed has now passed away, you can't do this anymore. All you can do is control what you control and, and then accept what now belongs to God. That other person's life is ultimately in God's hands. You have to accept that God has allowed this person to pass away before you and this person could reconcile. God allowed it. You have to accept it. Now, what can you control? You can confess everything you did. You can write a letter out to that person. What would you say to that person? Write a letter and just pray, God, I can't give it to them. You can see this. It's a very healing process. You can go to counseling. But what's going on in this moment is no longer actually about them. What's going on in this moment is about you taking control of what you actually control. Your response, the story you're writing about the situation. Control that. Accept what God has allowed. And then I think you can find somewhat of a settled state with that other person. Go ahead. How do you deal with a father that has never said he's proud of you and only called you a failure? Wow. So, so, so recognize this. It, it is out of his own pain. Go, go back to what I talked about a while ago and, and that concept of he, what he is saying to you is the voice he is hearing continually in his own head. So here's what often happens in relationships. We are in so much pain, we don't know what to do about it, that those close to us, we unintentionally inflict pain upon them, hoping that they will see our pain. So whenever, if your dad says you're a failure, you can say, Dad, I am, I am so sorry that you never have truly felt loved. I love you. And you can now literally bounce it back to him and try to speak life into him, while at the same time you need to find a way with with a friend, with a counselor, whoever, to have them assist you to recognize that that voice that your dad is speaking has power over you, and you want to do the best that you can to grieve that you're not getting what you deserve, but then also to tell yourself the truth. We, we We are all raised by fallen people, and this is a situation in which your dad has never been able to learn how to love. And in part, one thing that you can do, we're going to do the attachment class this spring. I think if you take that class, it would be very helpful on big Wednesdays. And I think what what you're hearing in this moment is your dad has never actually felt loved. And if you've never felt love, there is no way to communicate love. And so to begin to recognize, see, see him for what emotional age he actually is. 
he, he's not 40 or 50 or 60 or 70. He's a hurting five-year-old little boy who does not have the ability to give to you what you deserve. Grieve that, have empathy toward him, and then if, if there needs to be distance because he's foolish, you can't have a conversation with him, if there needs to be some distance, you can choose that wisely, and I would navigate it with a counselor to figure out what the right approach to that is. Okay? Several people have said they have been with family over Thanksgiving and just tried to help or enjoy their family, but the family was critical or belittling them, and they're just wondering how to navigate that, create boundaries to, uh, while also respecting their parents and family. Absolutely. So, so I think whenever it comes to criticism itself, if, if at all possible, I, I, I talk about, this is metaphorical, not literal, if at all possible, uh, take the first blow, the first punch. Again, not, not literal. If it's literal, call the police. Uh, but if, they give a ver- if somebody gives a verbal jab, ignore it. Don't respond to it. Don't engage it. Act like it wasn't even said. Keep on moving on. And, and sometimes that alone is enough. Sometimes a foolish person in that moment, the consequence of not being responded to, here's the mistake we make. Somebody says something critical and we immediately get defensive. Well, now we're defensive, now they're defensive, and now the boxing match has actually taken place. This is a great a- aspect with your kids, by the way, a- a- as well. When the first punch comes, take it, absorb it. Now, if it continues, then I think, again, not aggressively, not passively, not passive-aggressively, assertively say, that hurts my feelings. I do not appreciate that comment. And that comment is hurtful to me. I'm going to ask you not to make comments like that. I, I, I know this, this isn't really like you. I know you don't mean it in that way, but here's how I'm receiving it in this moment. And so you can take ownership now for your own response. And if they're wise, that conversation will work. And it won't be perfect, but, but you'll begin to work out that relationship. If they're not wise, that conversation will show you they're not wise, they're foolish, which now means we need consequences. So if you're on the phone with your mom and she's critical, you can say, Mom, I can't have this conversation with you if you're being critical like that. And if that continues, I'm going to have to hang up and call you back later. And if she criticizes again, then you say, I'm, I'm going to call you back later. And you hang up. You begin to put boundaries on the actual conversation of what is happening. And generally speaking, foolish people will begin to pick up on what's going on. So the issue here, I think, with all extended family is figure out if they're wise, have an assertive conversation, not aggressive. Have an assertive conversation. If that doesn't work, see them now as foolish and not judgmentally, but, but then begin to say, all right, here are the boundaries I'm going to set in, in line. Now, now, let me ask you one question here. It's easy to look at this uh, kind of triad as re- regarding other people. Where do you fall on this list? Can somebody have an imperfect conversation with you? And you able to manage your emotions to such an extent that it actually changes the relationship for the better? If the answer is no, Proverbs would say you're the fool. And so the, then what consequences do you need to begin to experience? We all should have the capability to grow up into wisdom where we can have conversation like adults and don't need time out like children. Let's do two more. How do... Um how do I provide resources for my parents when they clearly are struggling in their marriage but won't do anything about it? Okay. So, so let's go back. What's mine, what's theirs, what's God's? Their marriage. Their marriage. All right, can you influence it? Maybe. You can pray. If, depending on what age you are. Uh, may, maybe you can have a model, an example of what's different. But what can you do to, what was the, what, Jenny, what was the phrase to give them resources? Yes. Nothing. It's not your job. You can, students, if this is y'all, if your parents are struggling, there is nothing you can do for their marriage. It's not your responsibility. Thrive students. If, if your parents are struggling, that is their marriage. It is not their, your marriage. There is nothing you can do to change their marriage. And you need to now let go of, you need to accept that that doesn't belong to you. What does belong to you? 
your own life, your own healthiness, your own relationships, how, you, how that impacts you. It's not your fault, but now you take responsibility for it. You begin to move forward and how that's actually impacting you. Maybe you do some work with a counselor or read some books or, or, or come to some of our classes that we do in, in married life to begin to figure it out so it doesn't impact your future relationships. But notice the question here. What you're asking in this moment is, how do I control what doesn't belong to me? You can't. And it's a recipe for disaster. Now, let me change the question one bit. Let's say the question, the same question is asked. How do I, as a parent, help provide resources to the marriage of my children? You don't. You influence it through your own model, through your own prayer. You do not give advice unless asked. You do not be judgmental in any way. It is their marriage, and you try to support them along the way. But in the end, they're the ones making the choices, not yourself. But notice what happens. We tend to deny what we actually control, and we attempt to control what doesn't belong to us, and that is a recipe for anxiety, frustration, broken relationships, all those things. How do you impact your parents' marriage? You don't. One more. How do you have a healthy marriage if you grew up with toxic marriages all around you? In other words, how do you break the chains? You you break it, and you can. You can. It, it's, it's not a diagnosis that now is upon you forever. It's not a stamp that is for, upon you forever. Pastor Kurt, you've heard him talk about him and Kelly, uh, that their marriage is all about being a generationally breaking marriage to where they come from all this hurt and all this sorrow, and they are the ones who are going to be different, and they're being different, and you can be different as well. Your parents' marriage is not a definition upon who you are or what you're going to be. Come back to this idea of what do you control? What is yours? The, the story that you have, what they have done was theirs. It was their decision. You've been impacted by it in negative ways, no doubt. Now you take ownership for what has happened to you. Not your fault, but what has happened to me. Who am I? How did I become me? And you take ownership of that, and you begin to change the story. You figure out what is it in their experience that you don't want to replicate? What is it in their experience that empowered that to take place? How did those relationships begin to happen? Uh, you, you, you make sure none of that happens to you. You don't follow their model in any way, and now you choose a radically different path, and you literally can be transformed in comparison to who your parents are to such an extent that your parents can look at you and go, I wonder how he did that. And then you can become the married life pastor at Bayside. <laughs> and they're, they're watching right now. And they would be the first ones to say, we, we, didn't, we didn't figure it out. But that doesn't mean Jenny and I haven't figured it out. And, and, and th- their sorrow, their divorce, their pain that I was a part of, that I experienced, that has wounds still within my own life. They didn't intentionally try to do that to me. That's part of their own story. They have to own that. But I don't have to replicate what they experience. I can learn from their mistakes, and, and now I can go my own way. And that's part of what we do here at Married Life at Bayside. Let me lead us in prayer, and we'll conclude this service. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this night and and for these people, for all the questions that were asked. Uh, Father, I look forward to going through them and and finding ways to communicate answers, uh, hopefully that's based on your word and based on on who you actually are. Uh, Father, you've commanded us to live at peace. If if we've experienced peace from you, you've commanded us to live at peace with others. And so give us wisdom in that. Don't, Don't let us carelessly, from a surface level, take this passage and and then go do things that are, that are foolish, of getting back in relationships with people that we have no business being in relationships with, of feeling a burden now to be in the same room with people who have abused us. Don't let us do that. But let us, in wisdom now, respond to your word and know that it's life. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, allow us to live in such a radically different way that we can coexist here among a variety of people in such a way that causes others to look at us and go, what is different about you? And in that moment, we can point to you and say, it's, it's Jesus and it's only Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.